Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful. I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal. And I'm here tonight with Bruce McCurdy. Hey, Bruce. Hey, David. How are you doing today, late this afternoon, tonight? It's already dark, I guess. It is. <laughs> uh, well, I'm, I'm, I am today, Bruce, fantastic. My, I finally made some making some progress rehabilitating mm-hmm. my groin injury mm-hmm. and the Oilers are on a seven game win streak. So um, just what the Oilers needed, just what I needed, <laughs> just what the Oilers needed to be happy. Yeah. Fabulous. Bruce, the Oilers are playing fantastic hockey. Absolutely fantastic hockey right now. That was a really great game too. The Devils have a lot of very interesting players, some really strong attackers. And uh, the Oilers survived that. Um, this, in, you know, they're playing so well that they were clearly the better team uh, in this game, and they got a four-to-one win. The Grade A shots were eighteen to twelve for the Oilers, and um, so that would signify about a four-to uh, four-to-three game. Something 18, like that. 12? Four and a half, four and a half to three game for expected goals. When it came to five alarm shots, the most dangerous shots, so the others were equally dominant, 12 to seven over New Jersey. So okay. um, they, they really deserved the win, and they got the win. Bruce, let's... Um, well, they how deserved are you doing? the four goals, that's for sure. Yeah, that's for sure. How, how they got you... four, they hit three posts, they had two taken off the board by uh, referees, yeah. you know, and... and uh, at least one sort of miracle save by uh, by uh, Akira Schmid. Oh, Akira Schmid. Yeah. The, the, he shafted Hyman on a breakaway chance. Yeah. So anyway, they uh, they were full value for the four, even as one came into the empty. Well, two actually came into the empty net. Now that I think about it. That was a brilliant use of the word shafted, Bruce. Mm-hmm. It could not have been more descriptive and accurate. Um, how are you doing? Well, happier that uh, things have turned around. This was going to be a long season for us if it had continued for oh. the way it started. You know, there was people that were already bailing on the team, but that's never an option. We're covering the team, but... Those early games, they were just so painful. It's just like, how many games left? Sixty some. I'm like, but I was like, what? Were I, we I was always thinking they were be- they were way better than what we were seeing. I thought that they'd turn it around. I was just worried if you know if McDavid had something physical that was going to going to persist for weeks slash months, they were going to be in trouble. But whatever it was that he had, I think it's fairly safe to say that he's fought his way through most of it, and he's become his standard major impactor on pretty much every game at this point. That is a really good point. I, I do think the two things that you, like I was always fairly optimistic. And I think even if you went back and listened to the podcast, I mm-hmm. often was optimistic. I think maybe one podcast, I lost it pretty good there. <laughs> but other than that, I think I was always like thinking like, what this team can do it. This team can come back. And, um, but there was always two provisos to that, maybe three. The, f- the first was McDavid's health, and you just didn't know if, if he was going to continue to look like an, a, an average star player in the NHL, like a point-a-game guy, which is what he was for about 10 games. There was no way they were going to come back. Then the goaltending, right? If they couldn't f- figure it out and stop letting in such crap goals every game, you know, at least one crap goal a game, it seemed, they weren't going to do it. And then the the rush goals against Bruce, which we remarked upon repeatedly, it was just killing them. It was absolutely killing them. And so two things are different with the rush goals. They're they're giving up they're giving up fewer, right? They're making fewer yeah. bonehead plays in the um, offensive zone leading to rush plays against. And that started under Woodcroft. That was already coming around under Jay Woodcroft but it's continued. And the other thing they're doing a little better is they're timing their um, flops, their starfish to the ice a little bit better. 
and breaking up a few more passes that are coming over or making it more difficult to make those passes. Mm -hmm. The owners, every time they gave up a two on one, it seemed like they allowed a cross seam pass early in the year. Like the, yeah. the percentage of, of odd man rushes that ended up with great passes was obscenely high because the defensemen were misplaying those, those passes as well. So now, you know, highlighted last game with Darnell Nurse's fantastic starfish, five minutes left in the game, and he, he broke up a play. I but I think there was a couple tonight where they where they also um, made some nice defensive plays. They don't, they're not popping into my head off the, you know, right right, right now. But I think I, I did see just a little bit better play on the uh, defensive play when, when you're the last man back. I think Bouchard made one, actually, if I'm, uh, maybe shorthanded. Um it wasn't bad. Um, Bruce will do two good things each, two bad things, two numbers, and one conundrum. We forgot the conundrum last podcast, but did we? we did. I did. Oh. Yeah, that's on me. All right. Your first good thing. Okay. Uh, well, I'll go with the obvious uh, goalie, Calvin Pickard, who uh, drew into the lineup with a fair bit of pressure on him. I mean, he, the last two games that he played, the only two games that he played were both losses by the Oilers, the last two losses. Mind you, the second of those wasn't on him. He came in with the score 4 nothing, or should I say nothing 4, uh, 15 minutes into the first period, and he held Carolina to just one goal uh, and an empty netter in a, what became a 6-3 loss. Uh, but then he basically been wearing the ball cap since while Skinner was peeling off one win after another. And Picard gets a shot today, and I, th I thought they might wait till Chicago, but the more I thought about it on the weekend, I thought sooner is better. Uh, Stu looked a little bit sluggish last game, and uh, it was the right choice. But, man, the pressure was on. I mean, if he comes in today and he, you know, he lets in a couple of softies and they lose that game 4-3, you know, then where are we? Or, oh, the goaltending, what a mess. And yeah, and now we've got the, the um, uh, not very well-known backup coming in and delivering a strong performance. I thought especially in the third period, he was outstanding in this game and uh, wound up making 26 stops and uh, a few real tough ones off of guys like Jack Hughes and uh, uh, Jesper Bratt, you know, uh, They've got some pretty good offensive players over there on Jersey. And uh, he, he uh, stood tall, and I just thought he played a good, solid game. No chance on the the one goal, but uh, a couple others I thought might beat him and didn't. And good on him. What a, you know, what a huge win for him and for the team. And at minimum, he's earned himself now another start. There are a couple starts, and they can t a little bit take the heat off of the uh, Jack Campbell rehabilitation tour down there in Bakersfield, and say, oh, Jack, you know, you got a couple more starts, Jack, until I'm thinking Christmas before they even have to think about doing anything different than than right now, because Pickard maybe gets two more starts between now and then. Oh yeah, listen, Jack Campbell's just not getting it done. Now that I've stopped, I just don't want to even want to pay attention. Like I just want him to. To do whatever he's going to do, just I just feel like the, I thought he was going to get down to Bakersfield, you know, get some quiet and just get his game together. We're all just watching him like a hawk. I don't think it helps in a way. Like I don't know if he's paying any attention to it. Maybe he's not. Maybe it has no impact at all. But I just, I just want to not talk about it, not comment. Whatever happens in there, it's at the point where they should be playing probably Olivier or Rig. They'll they'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. Because and but this just exclamation mark on the fact hey this Pickard guy um yeah. maybe doesn't maybe they don't need to do anything it's a possibility so Bruce the New Jersey I just worked out their expected goals according to our numbers and they they had an expected goals of 3.5 goals today that's wow. how many you would expect them in the quality of their mm -hmm. shots and they got one so that's a hell of a game from Calvin Pickard and it's interesting you know when you look at his Record since 2017-18 in the NHL in a, just a very small number of games. It's atrocious. He's been, at, you know, he's been around 857 save percentage, 863, 892, 797, 874, 875. This is all in very small numbers of games, like 5-6, five, 5-6 six, five, six each season. But it's just been season after season when he's gotten an NHL chance, he's been poor. But 
in his in the last two AHL seasons, um, he, he he's kind of become again the goalie that people thought he might be earlier in his career because he really had a good you know between 2014 and 15 and uh, 2017 18 I guess really he looked like a fairly promising goalie and uh, so the last two years he with Grand Rapids 43 games he had a 918 save percentage in the HL and then last year in Bakersfield he had a 912 save percentage in 38 games so those are two solid AHL seasons and then earlier this year in just four games he had a 939 save percentage in the AHL and that this year in the NHL three games and a 918 save percentage so who knows maybe this is a a, a late bloomer Bruce it's been it's happened with goalies and <laughs> you don't want to I don't want to get ahead of myself this is his best he's probably looked in and felt for himself in years he should relish that but that was he, he does look fairly solid in the net in fact I wasn't paying too close attention to it. I was just kind of, and I didn't, I thought it was Skinner and net initially um, no. in the first period. I wasn't, I didn't, I didn't watch the pregame stuff. I just tuned in and I was catching up to the game. I tuned in a minute or two late and was catching up because he looked the same. He's the same kind of goalie, very solid square to the puck on the shots. And, you know, I don't think you can count on him or Skinner to make acrobatic saves. That's not their game. But if, if you're just asking them to make the first big save, it looks like at this point, both of them can do that. And then it's up to the Oilers to take care of the rest. And um, maybe that's the key for the Edmonton Oilers is, yeah, you're going to allow some great shots. But if you don't allow that great second shot or that great pass across for the wicked one-timer, that's how you're going to win. Get some good goaltending. Got some today. They did. All right. Uh, my good thing, Bruce, I'm going to go with the three wise men line. And I call the line of Sam Gagne, James Hamblin, and Derek Ryan that the three wise men, because they're, you know, they're not very big. They're not particularly fast. Maybe Hamlin's fairly fast. Uh, they're not particularly fast. They're not particularly ferocious. But do they ever have high hockey IQ? They have high, high, high hockey IQ. And I was just telling you before the play, I never expected to say that about Sam Gagne in his NHL career. Mm -hmm. He he was a <laughs> he was a terrible defensive center with the Edmonton Oilers when he was first here. He was constantly puck watching on the wrong side of the play, on the wrong side of the puck, getting beat repeatedly because he wanted to be an offensive attacker and cheat for the cheat for offense. And that's gone. He's not that player anymore. He is responsible defensively. Derek Ryan is is the most responsible forward on the Edmonton Oilers. He's always thinking out there. Hamblin seems to be a bit of a clone of Ryan. He's just smart. He's in the right place at the right time defensively, and he chips in a bit offensively. And for a fourth-line player, what else can you want? Now, there's going to be some people, and this is going to come up, the three wise men line isn't likely to last because people are going to want size and ferocity on that line probably. But if they keep not playing like size. this, Bruce, uh, not a lot of size. So, but if they keep playing like this, these guys might be able to stick together and they sure made a big play this game. Um, it was a, it was a face off win by Hamlin that kicks it all off. Um, a little bit later, the puck goes to Kulak at the point who makes a really nice play, putting it deep to Gagne behind the net. Gagne chips it out to Ryan in the slot who just pounds it in, and it's the first goal of the game. It's a period that the Oilers have, I think, outplayed the Devils and got the better of the chances, although both teams had chances. But it was just great <coughs> for that to be rewarded with a goal by that line. They had another uh, few chances. Hamblin, uh, I think he missed the net completely. He had kind of a wide open... Oh, that's right. He got a pass over from Gagne on a, on a very fine rush by that Three line. Three-way play, yeah. Three-way play, and he was unable to cash in, which he just handcuffed him a little bit as the pass was coming over. I thought it was going to go in, but he just couldn't get his stick on it. And then late in the game, it was um, Hamblin, who went behind the net, uh, won the puck, passed it out to Gagne in the slot. And Gagne put a really dangerous shot on net with just about uh, three minutes left in the game. <clears throat> but the thing that defines this line isn't their offensive play. It's the fact that you can send them out there, Bruce, 
and they're not going to give up much, if anything, on defense. Even though they're not the biggest guys, they're in the right position. And when they get the puck on their stick, they make they just take that. And this is what defined the Oilers in this game, I thought. That moment when you get it and you don't panic, where you take the time to make a play, you just take that extra second to make a little move or just wait for the play to shift a little bit for the players to change position. And that's when you make the pass. And, um, you know, we saw that, uh, just another example, not these three guys, but Leon Dreisettle, the power play setting up Evan Bouchard. He just he just held the puck very, very, very smartly. If he had, there was a moment where he could have tried to force that pass or, or kind of lofted it a bit, but it might have been knocked out of the air. He went to pass it. It wasn't there. So he held it. He waited. Then it was there. He set, he passes it back perfectly to Bouchard, who, who rocks it in. This line is really good at that. Mm-hmm. That little bit of puck protection in their own zone, that moment where you just take the moment to make a play as opposed to just fire, hammer the puck away um, to nobody or the other team. Yeah, the longer Leon held the puck on that power play uh, situation, the more um, uh, Michael McLeod, number 20 for Jersey, slid back towards his own net and it just opened up space in the sh- in the shooting and the passing lane back to Bouchard, and Bouchard was able to hammer the puck pa- just past McLeod, through kind of through his screen and into the corner of the net. And you could see when I watched the replay later, I just watched the forwards start to sort of cheat back and back. The more Leon and he was really he was really patient on that. But to get back to your three wise men. Uh, the Oilers have had 22 skaters so far this year, and exactly three of them are less than six feet tall. They would be Sam Gagne, five foot eleven, James Hamblin, five foot ten, and Derek Ryan, also five foot ten. So there's literally the three shortest guys on the team, <laughs> and yet they've uh, uh, they've combined to be a pretty effective uh, unit. What, what I really like about them is is their placement of the puck and to me Derek Ryan is really exceptional at this like today he had uh, I, I don't know how many shifts ended with the puck like in the corner behind New Jersey's net where he either dumped it in from center and made his line change at least three other occasions where he had to clear it from his own side of center and each time the puck just sort of died at the bottom of the face-off circle about five or ten feet from the icing line just perfect draw weight over and over again and he just does not leave the puck in bad spots. And Gagne was doing, you know, much of that same kind of thing today, just making safe plays and getting the puck to safe places where, you know, maybe they're going to have to battle to keep the puck, but what they're not going to do is have some jailbreak going the other way because some forward has passed the puck behind the other forwards and all of a sudden the other team is flying out of there, you know, and, and it's... Uh, uh, it's uh, it's good good to see for you know your fourth line you want at, at minimum you want no problems and I believe today they probably were all plus one were they Ryan plus one yeah Gagne plus one Hamblin plus one it was all on that goal because they gave up nothing yeah I don't know if I've ever liked Sam Gagne more as a player I like him as because, a winger more in the center eh yeah he, well he should have always been on the wing. Like Nuge, right? Like, um, like Adriano. Uh, yeah. And, um, you know, you got to try, though. When he first came in the league, Bruce, Sam Gagne, when he was 18 years old, he looked like he might be the next Joe Sackick, right? He had this unbelievable, he had great offensive talent and he could really fire the puck and he could, he really had a great offensive sense for passing the puck. And you decide if he continues to, if this guy develops with this kind of mm-hmm. offensive skill. Yeah. But it just wasn't really, it just wasn't elite enough on the attack um, to rise to that level. And then his defense was just, it wasn't there. His second incarnation with the Oilers, I thought he provided a lot of energy. And he was uh, quite a good energy player. He was good on the attack. He was okay-ish on defense. This time he's just really, I just see a player really committed to doing the right thing on the ice and being super smart because that's how he's going to survive in the NHL. And he's doing it. So I give him real credit. And if Hamblin can figure this out and play like these two guys, learn from these two guys and and mimic their play. And so far he's doing it. Well, the Oilers might have a real find there because um, that kind of player has a way of helping a team win. What's your second good thing, Bruce? Yeah. Uh, I think I'll, 
I have to single out again uh, the penalty kill, who yeah. uh, had another uh, you know all for performance or all for I guess from their perspective because uh, Jersey had four power play opportunities and they came away with no goals on uh, on six shots. There was uh, the last power play was the most dangerous of the four. They generated some good chances. That was the one where Connor Brown, Connor, Mister Unlucky Brown, got a penalty for not touching the guy that fell down in his vicinity. This after getting his what seemed to be his first goal wiped off the boards for uh, goaltender interference, which was and the right call. It was the, that was the right, call. Was the right the call. The other one, no, wasn't the right call. Yeah, because the re- the referee didn't even know where the puck was. He tra- he called the, the for st- stuff in the puck out of the out of the goalie's pad, and it wasn't in the goalie's pad. It was in the yeah. other corner of the net, and the guy they wound up bobbling it into their own net. And Mr. Referee was so sure that he he was right that he didn't even freaking look at the replay. I'm sure of it because the replay was pretty plain to see that no, the puck is actually over there. Anyway, what, Bruce, could uh, he could he just wait a second? Could he look at the replay? Because because his well, call, wasn't his call was replay. that he was oh they did wasn't his yeah. call that he was going to blow the whistle that his intention was to blow the whistle. So as soon as that mm-hmm. happens, no matter what the replay shows, it, I don't think it matters. Like honestly, well uh, you'd have to ask him. Except for guess what, you're not ever going to get the chance because the referee wraps those guys up in uh, bubble well, wrap. Cool. Like I'm not. It doesn't matter what he would say because I I think the rule is mm-hmm. if the any. If the referee's intention is to blow the whistle, he can't take that back, even if he hasn't mm-hmm. blown it. If that's what was in his head and that's what he's saying, then it's mm-hmm. over. And I think that's he was in the wrong position to blow the whistle. He should have been on the, well, if he had been on the other side. Wasn't where he thought it was anyway. Yeah, that happens. It's that's that, that happens, but uh, that's um, uh, the, the phantom penalty on Connor Brown was a bit much, and that that was the one where Jersey came closest and Pickard made a couple of big stops. But guess what? He's part of the penalty killing unit too, and uh, the four, uh, uh, well, the three forward units and the uh, two defense pairs. Plus, uh, I think Kulak got some minutes in this game because a couple of times the defensemen were in the box and yeah. they uh, uh, had to kind of use the the defensemen that aren't the regulars on the unit because uh, Nurse got one and Ekholm got one. But anyway, that PK unit has been uh, uh, super hot this last while. You know, lucky at times. I mean, it's hockey. You'd get a bounce or you don't get a bounce. And I, I think they probably got a bounce or two today. But uh, they, they got the job done uh, yet again four for four and uh, this was a game where a power play goal against would have uh, uh, made it a lot tenser indeed because it was a tense game right to the end uh bruce right. my my um second good thing will be matthias Ekholm, mm-hmm. who was part who was part of the regular penalty killing unit they, they were all all the defensemen did a really fine job on the pk they were all pretty good. Um, but I was really impressed just with Ekholm's movement of the puck. He made um, four major contributions to grade A shots, which for a defenseman not named Evan Bouchard is a really, really great total. For Evan Bouchard, it's another day at the office. Um, he He's really skating well. He's moving the puck well. He's playing like he did last year. And again, his turnaround due to injury, it took a while. It took about 10, 15 games. And he's really coming around in the last five games. He's looking like his old self. He was just moving the puck exceptionally well. And I can't, I mean, I don't remember specifically the, any of the grade A, pat, like the um, passes that he made for grade A shots, except for the one that ended up as a as a goal. And... Um, that's the one where uh, it's in the owner's end. He he wins the puck and he whips it up the ice to Hyman, who just barely misses it. And Hyman goes in and um, wins it on the forecheck against the, Akira Schmid. He, he should mm-hmm. stay in the net. He's like uh, Jacob Markstrom, just stay in the net. And he got tied up with uh, Hyman and, and Kane put it up front and then McDavid jammed it in. But that was just a really heads, another heads up passing play um, by Kane. And I think, 
it would be interesting for us to measure stretch passes since coffee because we actually track that i'll have to take a look at the stretch passes leading to go involved in um, grade a shots before and after paul coffee took over the defense but what you i think what we're noticing is that the, the defensemen are, are now as soon as they get the puck or before because you have to do this before the you get the puck or you're not going to make it generally speaking is Pucks on your stick, bam, the stretch passes there. And uh, we saw an excellent example of that uh, eight minutes into the game when Darnell Nurse um, got the puck. Connor Brown won the puck behind the net and he put it over to Nurse. And Nurse just fired a great pass up to Leon Dreisettle at the blue line. And Leon made an absolutely fantastic backhand pass to set up a Vander Kane who almost scored and was fouled on the play. So, um, Ekholm is doing it. Nurse is doing it. Of course, Evan Bouchard's been doing it from the from the start of the year. You have these big guys, Ekholm and Nurse, who who I don't I don't really want to see them honestly transport the puck, but I too much. But uh, when they get there, when Darnell Nurse gets his eyes up, he can really rip those passes, and so can Matthias Ekholm. And uh, we're that's what we're seeing game in game out right now. You know, two or four of Ekholm's. Um contributions were in fact stretch passes yeah in in this game uh, and one was a pretty good shot that he got where mcdavid set him up and he came up with a left wing circle and he fired a shot that uh, schmidt just got his blocker oh i remember it now on yeah. short side that's right and yeah. that was that was a good play and with both him and nurse like you're right about the the passing and I don't mind when either guy materializes occasionally in the slot. You know, it just sort of pops up as an extra option in, in, yeah. the, in the slot. And even if they're not necessarily a huge threat to score themselves, they, you know, when they flood the zone like that, that creates problems for the defense and a little chaos. And sometimes it'll open something up for somebody else. And once in a while, they will pop one in, you know. It's interesting. The defense seems to be both more active Actually, there's a, here's the difference. They seem to be more active moving into the play to score, not quite as active on the boards on the pinch, um, mm -hmm. would yeah. be what I would say. But mm -hmm. even though they're more active moving in to try to score, they're not giving up, generally speaking, um, those two-on-ones, although there was one three-on-one early in the game where Nurse moved up into the play and Leon made a fairly <laughs> risky pass. Uh, back and it, it and it was a, it like the orders had like a four on two at that point, and it, mm -hmm. the the pass didn't make it and it was Just a three on it. one, and um, Jesper Bratt went in there on the three on one and almost scored and then Nurse who had been who had charged in the play came back and oh. stopped the goal against with a great defense the defensive play of the game. All right, let's move on to our bad things. What's your bad thing? Yeah, well, I'm going to surprise you. It's going to be the goal by New Jersey. And it happened within, uh, what do we got now? Uh, 20, 30 seconds after Edmonton made it 3 nothing, And it was, it was one of those games where, you know, it was 2 nothing, and it, in some ways it felt like it should be more, but I was never sort of comfortable within this game because Jersey's yeah. got a lot of talent, and they, they sure seem to have a lot of zone time. And they made it. 3 nothing, and um, the next shift comes over the boards. And you know this is something I talk about often on this podcast because it happens often. After the orders score, they fall asleep. And they did it again, and it's like 3 nothing. I'm just going, okay, boys, this is a, you know, a nice rotation, every line, one shift, and you know, and we're in good shape. Very next shift. Uh, Pickard, gra there, there's some chaos, and Pickard snags a puck out of the air and gets a whistle. I think, good, calm things down, calm things down. So they get the face off in the D zone, and there's they, the puck comes up to Kane on the sideboards, and the orders are breaking out. Dry settles tearing up the middle of the ice, and Kane tries an aerial pass right through the middle of the ice. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Brown, I guess it would have been the guy who was trying to hit with the pass. And it goes like two feet over Brown's stick and down onto a New Jersey stick. And now in they come flying over the blue line. And, and Dry Settle is coming back from a long ways back. And as the Devils come in, they set up the play they want. And there's a cross ice pass. And there's really no oiler in 
position really that he wants to be and Brat slams it into the net just like that the three goal lead is gone now it's still it's two goal lead like before plus now new jersey's got some momentum and they're bringing it on so the penalty kill right after that was huge and it easily could have got to 3-2 with like 14 minutes left but that just thought that momentary uh oh game's in the bag now we can relax a bit and this is the nhl it's not in the bag yeah. evander kane and, and leon dry are brilliant attackers they are they are high risk uh, defenders, and this is an example of Kane, especially on this play, mm-hmm. you know, where he makes the high risk um, pass, yes. and then he he does get back, and he's trying to make the play, but he he stumbles around, and he's unable to cut out the pass across. Leon, it's a three. You got a three nothing lead. Leon mm-hmm. was leading the attack, but he had lots of time to get back and hustle back. And he, he was just a little slow getting back, so he doesn't cut out the pass. And these so these two guys, and so this leads into to my bad thing, Bruce. I think these are fantastic hockey players. But if, if you're protecting a lead late in the game, I and this has been every Oilers coach who has done this. And maybe in the long run, this is the right move, and I'll get into why, why that, that might be the case. But I've never liked this putting out Connor McDavid, Evander Kane, and Leon Dreisaitl when you're protecting a lead and there's an empty net. First of all, there's an empty net. And when an offensive player, I don't care who it is, without exception almost, maybe Jacques Lemaire or something, like without it, they just they just want to score. They want to get that point. And they're thinking point, point, point. And Kane and Dreisaitl and McDavid to a lesser extent are also zeroed in laser focused on the puck and so w- what we see is a rush where both Kane and Dreisaitl try to make a play at the blue line but they're both going for the puck instead of taking a body instead of taking a man skating with a man skating beside a man blocking a man hitting a man they both go for the puck and what happens Jersey just barges right by them charges right in fast to the Oilers zone you know it you can blame the players here, but I'd. What do you expect is going to happen? This is this is going to happen. Why don't you have the three wise men out there? Why don't you have your checking line out there, or or make, even McDavid's line out there? McDavid, Nugent, Hopkins, and Hyman. Although I wouldn't have Hyman out there because he's the same. Like he's he's the same kind of offensive player. Like these are all fantastic. Fantastic hockey players, but get your defensive special. Get the guys that you you, you trust to kill the penalty, penalty out killers. there. Get your PK guys out there in that mm-hmm. moment, coaches. And so now I I don't like it. Versus, I'm just going to give you why I think in the long run it might be the best strategy. Because I've heard this idea too. Until your best players learn how to beat the other team's best players, you'll never win in the playoffs. It has, they have got to learn those hard lessons about playing defense. And I can't remember which coach said that or believed it. It might've been, maybe it was something, I can't remember if it was something that Babcock said or which coach said it, but one of the, one coach made that point. And I think there's something to it. So you're sending your best players out there and you're asking them to step up as defensive players. Maybe in the long run, you're going to have some hard lessons and there was they um, they got two absolutely wild scoring chances from Jack Hughes on this on that play mm-hmm. after Kane and, and uh, Drysdale got beat at the blue line. You know McDavid was back at least, and then he got beat on the pass, but he was back trying to make the play. He wasn't puck watching. He well, Drysdale got beat on an aerial pass by Hughes on the zone entry, and that was basically a perfect pass. I thought I, I didn't think he did a lot wrong there, but take hit him, hit the take the man. Well, it's five on six, David. It's still, it's like penalty killing. You don't see many hits on the penalty kill for a reason. They got one extra guy. Anyway, Escape the extra up. guy in this case turned out to be Hughes, who wound up alone inside of the net and, and uh, got stuffed twice by Pickard. Yeah. And I'll, I'll make the additional point that one of the reasons you do want those guys out there is for what happened shortly after that was when... when uh, Drysaddle made a play in the neutral zone to disrupt uh, the play and get it going the other way. And then McDavid stole it and passed and Kane scored, you know. So <laughs> that's one way to 
deal with an empty net situation is actually get that goal and and they often get it but i i'm kind of with you I, you know i almost want to treat it like killing a penalty yes uh, you know because it is an odd man situation you know there's a lot of assignments and there's boxes to be checked and at least they're not putting to be checked as well yeah at least they're not putting Kane on the pk like they did earlier this year that drove me crazy like <laughs> He's got anyway. a great record on the PK, but it's hard to see is how he, really? he got it. Yeah, for, <laughs> yeah like so goals for to goals against has has been very good for years, and it's hard to see how that's the case because he's not exactly conventional. No, I don't know. Anyway, I would I would just prefer to see defensive. Get your penalty killer guys out there in that moment, and, and um, but like you say, they did score the goal, so uh, and and they they are able to do that. But I think actually the Penalty kill guys, not, you know, except for maybe Josh Archibald, are able to score. You know, if you have Yanmark could score in that situation or um, Nugent Hopkins could score in that situation. Mm-hmm. Fogel, you know, they're all capable of hitting an open net. So uh, Ryan, he can, he can certainly make the play. Anyway, it's an interesting strategy. Every Oilers coach has done it. Yep. Knobloch's now doing it. So... With you have all these great coaches doing it, I'm saying don't do it. I'm I must be wrong, and they must be right. But uh, I still I think don't like. The theory it. is as simple as get your players out against their best players with the game. Yeah, on. that's it. And it's oh. and it's um, your best players might be cheesed off if they're not trusted in that moment. And and maybe that's the most important thing. Maybe that's why it's done, because um, you don't want your best players cheesed off. <laughs> you you need them. Not yeah. to, you need them. You need them to fully buy in, and maybe over time, they learn to play really, really super solid defensive hockey in that moment. So we'll see. We'll see. I hope I'm proven wrong on this, Bruce. This year in the playoffs, <laughs> your number. Oh uh, yeah, I'm going to go with. Uh, um, well, officially it's 25. Uh, this is the number of New Jersey shots that were blocked by uh, by the Oilers, even as the event summary only credits 22 shot blocks by the Oilers. Um, so three of them were maybe hit the refs, I don't know. Anyway, uh, these numbers should be the same, and I'm sure they'll fix it. Uh, but especially the defense, uh, seven block shots for Darnell Nurse, and actually eight wow. for the national stat tracks trick. So that's uh, six for uh, Vincent de Harnay. And every defenseman uh, with at least a couple of, uh, or, well, at least a block shot were, were contributing in this uh, department. And, I mean, New Jersey only had 27 shots on net. And so Pickard made 26 saves and the, the team blocked 25 shots. So that's a, a fairly reasonable team commitment to defense. Again, I wasn't fully happy with the third period. On the other hand, one well, of my good things are the goalie and the penalty kill, and my number is the number of blocked shots. Maybe I have to say I'm fairly happy with the defensive effort overall. Bruce, my numbers are related to Coach K's record with the Oilers here. And um, it's I'm going to be comparing um, how the Oilers did um, are doing right now in the 12 games that he's coached not to um, the start of the year with um, uh, the 13 games with uh, Woodcroft, because I think that's in some ways an unfair comparison in that there were so many injuries then um, that it's, it's hard to compare the two units, but I will compare them to, and and it would be probably fairest to pick the, the hottest 12 game streak under Woodcroft, but I haven't identified that yet. Maybe I will. But if, if you are imagining that this version of the orders under coach Knobloch is the best version of the orders you've ever seen. You might in the McDavid era, you might be right is what I'm going to suggest. This is an utterly dominant team right now. And um, so the numbers I'll compare it to are the best stretch season long stretch for the Oilers were under Woodcroft was, um, was last season. And um their grade A shot differential was positive 2.9 per game. 2.9 per game. In this, under under Knobloch, it's plus five per game. 
the five alarm shots for uh, Woodcroft in that in that really good season, uh, and the Oilers were plus one point seven. Under Knobloch, it's plus two point six for the five alarm shots, and the goal differential for that whole season was plus zero point nine for the Oilers that year, and in this stretch, for, it's plus one point five goals a game with Coach K in these twelve games. So this is just it's little wonder that they're beating so many good teams right now. They are playing their they're playing the lights out. They are just playing fantastic hockey. And again, the, a more fair comparison would be to find the best stretch under Woodcroft, which I probably will try to find later tonight or something I'd like that. But suggest you look in the 18-2 and 1 role that they went on post Ekholm trade last year. You'll find it yeah. there. Yeah, you're probably right, Bruce. Have a look. I'll look at those games and see how that compares and see. But this is, um, this looks about the same as that, doesn't it? Like they were super dominant. That's why we, That's why everyone was predicting, really, not everyone, many, many people were predicting winners would win the Stanley Cup after the Eckholm trade based on their play in that run because they were just dominant. And then they just <laughs> couldn't keep that up in the playoffs against better competition um, for one reason. But anyway, they're back. They're they are completely back, and it's not surprising they've won seven games in a row because they deserve to have won seven games in a row. They they've been the better team, I think, in all those games. I haven't, um, and certainly the better team tonight. Yeah, well, 12, 12 and one sounds a lot better than five, twelve and one now, doesn't it? <laughs> and I, lots of folks are. Ready to write off the season, but boy, they write at the ship in a, in a in a quick hurry. I thought it was going to take a lot longer than this to get back to you know 500. Yeah, I I thought so too. I thought it was going to take like two and a half months to get back. Like no, they're still not actually back in a playoff right. spot. Right. Um. So he's been here a month, I guess. And um. Let's just see what the standings are now, Bruce. Have uh, many other them. teams. Yeah, they're three points out of uh, uh, the last wild card spot with two games in hand on Nashville. Okay. And they're uh, three shots, points out of the first wild card spot with one okay. game in hand on Arizona. And then St. Louis is ahead of them by two points, but Oilers got two games in hand with them, and they're tied with Calgary, but Oilers have two games in hand on them. So, you know, when you when you fold in the games in hand, they're right there. Boy, the Kraken sure have cracked. Mm -hmm. 28 seven. games, eight wins. Wow. Uh, seven in a row. Minus 24 goal differential. The Oilers now have a plus four goal differential. So, um, yeah, it's, it's looking a lot better than it did. Um, on just on uh, November twelfth, when Jay Woodcroft was fired, although he was fired after the first real glimmer of major hope, the big win over mm -hmm. Seattle. That was the turning um, point, which was sense. which was a huge turning point, and they looked as good that night under Woodcroft as they've looked since then. So, you know, maybe the orders would have done this under Jay Woodcroft. I'm not saying we just we will never know that, yeah. but um, I'm not convinced. I'm not convinced there was there's something that. Uh, Coach K does that Woodcroft is doing that Woodcroft did that that's fundamentally different. Um, but maybe there is. Maybe, maybe this is maybe they needed Paul that change. Cos it's Paul Coffee. Could be. Whispering into their ears to remind them how good they are and give them all the positive reinforcement. Yeah. The He's D saying Matt make whisperer. plays and uh Vincent de Harney, I'll mention him again. Making plays, making passes, coming out of the zone, stretch passes in a couple of cases tonight, and you know, moving the puck as opposed to just dumping it out. And they're all, um, they're all uh, getting uh, uh, just more involved in sort of five-man unit uh, possession hockey. Yeah. Alrighty. The conundrum. I just think mm -hmm. we dealt with the conundrum already, Bruce. The conundrum okay. is how, how did how, you know how are they doing this as compared to before uh, under Woodcroft? And uh, do you have any others? Any other thoughts about it? 
Uh, well, a lot of it is health related. Uh, I do think that there have been adjustments made on the penalty kill, which are real and yes. the results are real. Uh, and there's, um, uh, but some of us, you know, just guys like Ekholm, especially McDavid, uh, but uh, Ekholm and uh, uh, as a, a key player, but I think they had a couple other guys, like there was lots of chat that Leon was maybe playing under 100%. And of course, you don't, know exactly how much of that to take take uh, for real uh, but uh, uh, I just think as as a group they're they they're looking and playing healthier more energy and and uh, when something goes against them the roof doesn't necessarily cave in which it had been doing well you have the great uncaver of roofs and Connor McDavid to score a goal when you need one I would, we've already remarked upon the defense being, I think, having their heads up more, looking for the stretch passes more. And I think they're just more mobile. They're moving more. They're skating more. And that may actually be a, a difference between the way Coffee and Manson coach them. Uh, the, the third thing, the other one last thing I would mention is that just like there's more stability on the PK, I think we're seeing more stability on the third and fourth lines. Yeah. And um, I've all... I've been making this point for some time now. I think the owners, you need a third line you can trust to put out there against the top line of the other team. I think we saw that uh, on occasion tonight where um, the Ryan McLeod line was trusted against one of the better lines of the Devils, and that really does open up your team to play the McDavid line or the drive set line against a weaker line on the Devils. And that never happened under Woodcroft, as far as I know. They just didn't trust those that McLeod line against um, top-scoring players on the other team, and they're doing it now. And I think it's essential if you're going to win um, to have that kind of third line you can really trust. And now they got the the old the, you know the three wise men line, um, who's like another checking line. So this is ideal um, right now to have four lines that you can that you can count on. Like the dry subtle Kane um, Brown line still isn't that it's not a high functioning line yet. They had something going on the attack tonight. They were they made some good plays, but they're still they're still not fully you know. So we'll see how that turns out. What I like is he's kind of sticking with it. He's sending them back out there game after game and say, okay, you guys figure it out. These are all highly skilled, proud hockey players, highly motivated, and maybe they're going to like you know maybe we'll see this line really really crank it up. Connor Brown had a better game tonight than he's had. Um, I thought Leon Dreisaitl had some struggles on defense, but he was really good on the attack. So um, we'll see how that works out. But it is the one kind of question mark still is is that second line. They're not getting optimal performance out of any of those three players, I'll suggest. Yeah, well, at the same time, though, if, to break up that line means forces you to break up one of the other lines. Yes. And there was talk last game, I think we were saying, there was talk during the broadcast of taking Nugent Hopkins off of the McDavid line. And the more I thought about it, I more I'm going, well, why would you do that? Like that line is like eleven goals four and one against in a, you know an hour that they've been playing together. They're just absolutely crushing the other team and scoring enough goals to win the game. So why would you mess with it? If you're exactly. losing if you're losing, yeah. then then maybe you gotta switch things up a bit. But if you're winning and one of your lines struggling, well just keep winning and hope that that line sort of figures it out, like you say. Well, they dressed at a line had a really hard assignment tonight. I thought, I think they were out there mostly against the Hughes line, if I'm not mistaken. I was thinking, oh boy, how is this going to go? Because that Hughes line is fast. And um, I don't know if that's borne out in the numbers, Bruce, or you're just checking. But I was yeah. thinking, e -e -e. and they generally, they got, they did get the one goal scored against them. But um, I thought they were, they, they were okay-ish. You know, they did okay. So... That's a start. Maybe they, you know you build on that a little bit because that that could have gone sideways really fast early in the game, as opposed to when it was uh, three nothing and there was a little bit more of a cushion. Final thoughts. Seven in a row. Seven in a row. If I'm not mistaken, this match is their longest win streak in. Uh, Many years. I think they had a seven gamer in uh, uh, late in 21 22. 
And then of course last year down the stretch they had a they had a long run, but it was broken up by a you know a lo- one loser point kind of game. But they uh, uh, they needed a big winning streak and they delivered it right away. You know when they, once they turned the corner they turned it so it's full speed ahead. Well, as you say, Bruce, never in doubt. Never mm-hmm. in doubt. Never in doubt. We never doubted them once. No, I don't. I'm pretty sure about that. <laughs> Bruce, thanks for talking tonight. Thanks for listening, everyone. And in the meantime, and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast. <laughs>